I'm Barry O'Connell, uh, and I'm here for a conversation with Lisa Brooks, my dear colleague and friend, who has written the se a second outstanding book. Both of them should be read by every student of things American. And we're going to talk about our newest book, Our Beloved Kin. And I should say just a word about how much of an honor it is to even sit and have a conversation with Lisa. She's too modest to accept this, but it's the case. She's made a huge difference in a short time at Amherst, a superb teacher, someone who deeply cares about students and colleagues, and is the truest citizen, not just of Amherst, but of a whole community she gathers around her and renews and draws sustenance from, that is the American Indian or Native American community throughout New England. And we'll talk more about that because it's an enormous presence in her book. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna begin by talking a little bit about the meaning of the title of her mm. book, Our Beloved Kin. In a way, it says everything her beautiful book says. Our Beloved Kin is not only a reference to all of the indigenous population in New England and their sense uh, in the 17th century of their relationships to all the other native peoples in New England. Our beloved kin is a way of subtly saying, we are still here. Mm -hmm. Native people have not disappeared, though they've often been rendered invisible by the way they've been ignored or presented as gone. So our beloved kin in this book title says, read this book not only for the history, much of which is focused in the 17th century, mm -hmm. but for what it tells you about how Native people survived. Mm -hmm. um, now, Titles for anybody who's written a book are one of the most difficult things. Mm -hmm. You can have sleepless nights over titles. Mm -hmm. You can make lists of 20 or more of titles mm -hmm. and find them all just wrong. Mm -hmm. So it says something about this book that Lisa has worked on for over, over a decade. Is that mm -hmm. fair? Yes. Um, everything in this book is carefully rendered. And when you see this title, which is truly a beautiful title, you know something about how the book is going to proceed and affect you. Mm -hmm. You might say a word about how you got to that title. Mm. Well, it was just like that, right? Um, not just lists, but titles that were right. merely placeholders, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, I, I never felt satisfied with the title as it was. And um, with my first book, I mean, the title came to me when I was in the midst of research, right? It, it made sense of all of the things that I was looking at at the time. Um, and I had it with me through most of the writing. Um, with this one, I was almost at a loss for what the title would be until I think I might have already been deep into the final revisions of the book. And I think the press actually said to me, you know, the working title that I had wasn't going to work. And I didn't say it at the time, but I, I could have said, well, yeah, I could have told you that, <laughs> you know. Um, but this one, I think it did come once the press kind of had me down to the wire and I had to pick the final title. This came really quickly and it was almost like a, a subconscious thing that rose to the surface and it both is, um, embedded within the very first document of the of chapter one, the very first document that deals with Widamu, um, the Songswa of Pukhasset. Um, but it also speaks to um, what I found over and over again in the research and in the documents that at every turn, um, every native figure in this history, um, no matter where they were placed in the war, was seeking to protect their kin. Yeah, yeah. But I would also say that if you out there that we're talking to read this wonderful book, mm -hmm. if you look at the acknowledgments, you will see another listing of our beloved kin. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, mm -hmm. There are people speaking for every indigenous community in New mm -hmm. England now mm -hmm. to Lisa and doing the research, helping her in an enormous variety of ways yeah. beyond That's what right. gets listed even. And that, you know, from meals to hints to there might be a document here, mm -hmm. or there's a, uh, an oral history we've kept for a long time that we're willing to share with you. So that is another aspect of this book that I think is really important. Mm 
Mm -hmm. There's been a renewal in the last 30 years of attention to indigenous people and a great deal of good scholarship. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that's often missing in that scholarship is a rootedness in existing native communities. Right. Um, and that rootedness requires people being patient and gaining trust, especially if they're not native, but even if they're native. Oh, yeah. Uh, the people have to know this is a person, A, who can listen to me mm -hmm. and who knows, in, in this case I'll use a particular problem, that she does not know what she needs to know right. and is at rest with that. Mm -hmm. And so you might say a little bit of the process about that community and its role mm -hmm. in the book. Yeah, I mean, you describe that experience perfectly, right? Um, because... Um, even as a young woman in the Abenaki community, and um, I mean the Abenaki community up in Missisquoi, but also the, the wider community, I knew there were so many people who were either doing research or um, talking with me or other people about oral history um, who knew so much about our history, and that's who I first learned from. Um, and most of those people aren't publishing um, in academic journals, right? And, and aren't academics. And aren't academics, exactly. But that knowledge is very deep and often can't be accessed um, in the usual ways that academic historians would, would pursue. So um, I knew really early on that that was important to any work that I would do. But I also found out once um, I got into graduate school that this wasn't the norm, right? Um, and so I feel like part of the work that I've been doing over the years alongside many, many people and many of your colleagues, right? I mean, this has been ongoing for decades, is trying to really emphasize how important it is that we do that listening, that careful listening um, to the tribal historians and community members who hold the knowledge that can help us to understand this history. And I do think listening and relationship building is key. Um, and for me, yeah, it often was just asking, um, people that I knew to be holders of this history, um, how do you see this? You know, um, what do you think about this document or, or what's important to you about this place? And it wouldn't be in an interview format or, or even as formal as we're sitting here today, but it often is walking places and sitting at kitchen tables and, um, and yes, always feeling like I don't know. <laughs> and being okay with that, as you say, and knowing that even after I've spent over a decade immersed in this history, I still don't know. <laughs> and so that's one of the reasons why the, the book actually ends by not ending, by opening it up to more possibilities, because I know coming up, tri up from tribal communities right now are people of all ages who are wanting to understand more of their histories and, and so I want to invite people, right, um, to continue to engage this history because there is so much that I don't know that I still need to know. Well, if I take from that a particular thing I want to take, mm -hmm. so I'll warn people about this. Uh, if you're trained in history and culture, as both of us have been, mm -hmm. Part of that training, implicit sometimes, but often very explicit, is that what you do, if it's going to be of quality, has nothing to do with any community that is present mm. and outside the walls of the academy. So one of the things I would say about Lisa's work, both in The Common Pot, her first and magnificent book as well, is that in a, what I think is always a modest and quiet way, that may not be entirely fair to you, she has resisted undermined and ignored some of the most constricting mm -hmm. ideas academic historians have about how you write history. Okay. So one of the things that we haven't yet talked about that's important in this to me, and uh, it, it abashes me to say part of what I'm about to say, Lisa walks her books. I couldn't <laughs> walk the distances she has walked, <laughs> both for the first book and the second book. Yeah. Landscape, not pretty picture landscape, but how you get from one place to another on foot, mm -hmm. from one indigenous community to another, uh, following the pathways or figuring out the pathways in the 17th century that different people and different armed groups and, uh, and, and different English people were taking. Mm -hmm. um, it probably isn't the case, but you can correct me, that you've covered every, mile, every possible mile on foot, mm -hmm. but you've done a lot. 
And what that means in the writing is that the, 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 that the landscape becomes as alive as the characters who are inhabiting it, the historical mm -hmm. persons. Mm -hmm. uh, so that th there's a kind of pleasure in reading uh, Lisa, not only because she's a wonderful writer, but because she's unusual in what she does. And part of the pleasure is you live almost three-dimensionally in the world she recreates. Mm -hmm. That's an amazing mm -hmm. achievement, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. And I know that's what you were reaching for. I was, and it means so much to me to hear you say that because I really do feel like um, that is what I was trying to create, is a, a three-dimensional experience for the reader of this history as, as nearly as I could imagine it and recreate it myself. And I don't want to, s I, I hesitate almost to use that word imagination because I don't want anybody to think I'm just kind of picturing all of this in my mind. This is based on very deep archival research and research on the ground and the land and the yes. language and and um, and those very important archives. Um, but for me to understand the history, I can spend all the time that I want to immersed in the documents and the maps that help me to try to reconstruct the place in my mind. But at the end of the day, I almost never could write until I got out um, on the land and the places that I was writing about. Um, and um, and that is what I think then helped enable me to then create that um, in the book because you 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 know the finer details of what the land probably looked like in the 17th century, right? But the land still teaches you <laughs> um, on the ground um, about its character. So even if there is a farm there, you can still see where the terraces are right, where women planted fields, you can still see the time of year that land turns green as opposed to other places and how fertile it is. You can, you can still see the swamps and the many different plants um, that would have been seen as medicine, as edible plants, but then would have been seen as frightening animate um, beings to English soldiers coming through. Um, and I guess that is, that's one of the many ways that I was taught as a young person, probably throughout my life, how to be able to read the land, right? And so I think one of the things that I, I am trying to do in the book is help other people to, to see that, to kind of read alongside me, but to then be embedded in it, right? So when I'm writing, I feel like I'm embedded in the writing. I don't feel like I'm, I'm trying to understand from up above. So I think that's one of the things that I'm striving to do in both books, but especially in this one, is to bring people in um, to that place world. So I should alert all of the people I hope will read your book after they see us talking about mm -hmm. it, that this book of yours, uh, Our Beloved Kindred, Kin, is uh, a slower read, not because it's unpleasant, mm -hmm. but because each piece is so rich. So I read it under some pressure because I was copy editing to mm -hmm. help. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, you know, I needed to get it back to Lisa. And I remember at one point, I was sort of in the middle of the manuscript, I swore out loud. <laughs> and my wife said, is something wrong? And I said, well, there's this thing she does that I'm trying to get her to stop doing, quote, misusing <laughs> while. And I have to mark them all. I said, no, <laughs> because I can't slow down. She's got me in the middle of this place. Right. And I'm not ready to leave it. And I have to keep going. Yeah. That is to say, the slowness here comes from how much it is alive in the text. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a, it's a particular and unusual kind of reading experience mm -hmm. as a result. I'm going to turn to King Philip's War mm -hmm. shortly, but not yet. Mm -hmm. Because I think I want to place people, and you can help me do this, mm -hmm. in that geography. So mm -hmm. this is a book that, that we're in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. we're in Rhode Island, Mm -hmm. We're in all, virtually all parts of Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. uh, we're a bit in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. uh, we're certainly in present-day Vermont and New Hampshire mm -hmm. and parts of Maine. Mm -hmm. uh, and these are, of course, if you know any of these places, there's an extraordinary v variety of landscapes. Mm -hmm. And those landscapes get animated in this book in part because we're dealing with a war uh, not only and exclusively, but we're dealing in a war between a coalition of native peoples and a coalition of uh, English colonials. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are coalitions, that's to be stressed, because they're not simply united at, at, on any side. That's right. uh, but the way in which they come together and antagonism and the ways they don't mm -hmm. has a great deal to do with what the landscape is and what it's, 
uh, how it speaks to which needs mm -hmm. practically of these many peoples. Mm -hmm. So that, that because of what Lisa does, uh, we really are in that, those places in New England powerfully, mm -hmm. richly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it makes me think of two places in particular that became centers during the war, which often don't get as much attention as they should. And, you know, the, the English at the beginning explained to their native neighbors how, um, despite their own individual feelings, that they had to ally with Plymouth because all Englishmen have to do that. Um, and they expected that the Indian people would do the same. <laughs> But of course, there wasn't really yet any concept of a racial group that the English called Indians, right, right? Mm -hmm. among Native people. And there was this real questioning of like, well, why, why would we do that? And why would you do that, right? <laughs> they knew right away that when the, when the war opened, um, that this was something very different than they had ever seen before in their homelands. And the Nipmuc people in particular created a sanctuary very early on that initially was to create a space for councils that was that could, could not be under the surveillance of, of this colonial power that was beginning to amass. But that place, which was called Menemiset, it's an island place in this network of wetlands, um, became the sanctuary for people from all over. And it protected many, many families for, for many months um, during this war. Um, and so there were these places like, like swamps, so you're talking about the particular kinds of lands, right, that, that created almost what we would think of as a fortress, even though <laughs> they were not built, right, from brick and mortar, right? right, right. Um, and it was because of their knowledge of the land as opposed to the newcomers um, that, that they were able to create this fortress. But then there were fortresses like Ossipee, which is up in what is now um, part of Maine, at the confluence of, of the Ossipee and Saco River, that was another fortress um, that was out of reach of the English, and where the English tried to uh, approach several times, but were held back by the landscape. My favorite is their planned expedition on Ossipee in December of 1675, um, when they planned to go and take this stronghold, and they didn't get far at all because of the four feet of snow. They didn't know the native technology of snowshoes. They knew about it, but they didn't know how to use it or make it or anything like that. So native people, meanwhile, are freely moving in these you know, uh, winter landscapes, but English people were hindered by it. Um, and Ossipee wasn't attacked at all during the war. You know, it remained this protected place. Wonderful. Yeah. So there is um, a kind of notion and it's in the subtitle that this is a new history of King Philip's War. Now, I'm much older than Lisa, mm -hmm. and I've been doing this much longer. And like her, but in a different s time, I've read many histories of King Philip's War. Mm -hmm. And I won't bore you by summarizing where I think they all come out. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you should say something about, well, new? Yeah. <laughs> what, what, what is new here? I use that word almost facetiously, right? Because what I don't want to do actually is claim that this is the new history, disregard all the old histories, you know, this is the one. And so I think I want to make sure that um, anybody who reads the book immediately before even starting um, turns to the, um, the quotes right yes. up at the beginning of the book, the epigraph, where you'll see... Do read it. Yes, I will, where I... I will read you the quote from Joseph Laurent, who was a phenomenal um, Abenaki scholar um, who published a book called New Familiar Abenaki and English Dialogues in 1884. And these words are drawn from his book, Pili Kisos, The New Moon, Pildoi Odzmongan, A New History. So I mean this fully a new history in the Abenaki way, which is that it's something that um, appears to be new, but is really cycling back, right? Um, so that uh, uh, when the new moon comes, right, we experience it as if it's, it's something we haven't seen before, and yet we know it's something that comes around every month, right? So it's like, uh, I teach a course here um, called The Spiral of Time in Native American Knowledge, and it's very much based on this idea of the spiral, right? Which is this, it is not that time is a circle, just that the same thing keeps coming around again. It's that 
it, it's almost like it is spiraling, right? So it's, if we can imagine history as an activity that's always spiraling, and so this is giving us what might feel to some like a new view, but to some others, it might feel like an old view coming back, back around. Again. So then I need you, myself, to say how it's new in terms of the other tradition, mm. that is the Anglo historical tradition. There are different ways that I'm approaching um, this war, uh, many different ways. Um, maybe the most important is that I didn't set out to write a book about King Philip's War. That, that wasn't my goal um, at the beginning. And in fact, if I had even had that inkling early on, I would have hesitated to do that completely. And even at the moment when I realized that, oh, this is beginning to become a book about the war, <laughs> I was very hesitant to even think of it that way um, because it was really the, the figures and the places that I was drawn um, to ask questions about and understand more. So um, Wiedemu, the, the leader of the, the Wampanoags, who was a song squaw, a, a female leader, a rock woman, I was very drawn to um, unpacking how she appeared particularly at first in the written sources because she is such a beloved figure in the Wampanoag community, so well known in the native New England community. I kept asking, why is it that she doesn't appear in the histories, yes. right? Um, and in particular, the histories that have been written by historians during the last many, many decades, Hundred hundreds of years, yes. right? Yes. Why does she take a back seat? doesn't make sense to me. Um, so, and especially since her story was so powerful and that she's not an anomaly. In other words, it, she wasn't an exception she's not because a she was a female. Right. She's not a, f it's not, she's not an exception because she's a female and a leader and she certainly wasn't a heroine. You know, as I've said about her, as a, as a leader, she was just simply doing her job, right? Um, so I was very drawn to her story um, because I, um, worked at Harvard, I was very drawn to the story of the Harvard Indian College, um, the roots of our entire literary and educational system today, going back to that place that was both a place of, um, of colonial missionary efforts and a place of, of exchange between peoples who spoke different languages and came from different cultures. Um, and so I was especially drawn to James Printer because so many of the stories that we tell about early education, Indian education, are about somebody dying or going home or just kind of failing, disappearing. And James was just like this story of persistence and survival and the way that he used tools like writing, literacy, um, diplomacy between different cultures in order to protect his kin. Um, very drawn to James. Mary Rowlinson, who of course um, wrote um, really probably one of the first captivity narratives written in English in the colonies, definitely one of the first women writers. Um, and the fact that she wrote about both Wiedemu and James in her captivity narrative, but also the fact that most people teaching and reading Mary Rowlinson which is taught, as you well know, all over the country, have no idea who the Native people are with whom she traveled, including Wiedemu. <laughs> um, and who, they have, who was her mistress? Who was her mistress, yeah. exactly, who she traveled with, as she said, that whole time. Um, and they know very little about the Native places through which she traveled, or even that there were Native places. <laughs> so I felt an absolute drive to be able to make it so that that it would change that anybody teaching or learning Mary Rowlandson's narrative could be able to frame it through those native people she traveled with and the native places with whom she traveled. Um, and finally, because I had been immersed in, in Abenaki history for my whole adult life, I felt like that was a huge context that was missing, that, that most people had no sense of what existed or what was happening um, north of what is now the Massachusetts border. Um, and that that story needed to be re retold um, because also so many of the survivors went north and found refuge there. Again, so it wouldn't just be a story of, of, of people dying, of some kind of final, um, the, the end of Native people. The end of Native people, right? And so I was really invested in these stories also of continuance, whether it was James Printer or whether it was um, the people who went north. 
there's a way in which the history of indigenous peoples across the continent is often, maybe even commonly, written in terms of defeat uh, and, and disappearance. Yes. Uh, and here there is always an issue because if you end Indian history in defeat, you end Indians. That's right. And it's not that defeats didn't happen and were not common. They, they mm -hmm. were common. But thinking about how history is not simply uh, you defeat a people you want to get rid of and everything about them disappears, including any survivors. Mm -hmm. and, the no and we fail to understand the real history, and by which I mean if I were to write the history of every American in a certain period, mm -hmm. what that would mean is telling people there are all these people you didn't even think about. There they are, and they were doing important things. Mm -hmm. uh, they, for a number of reasons, they didn't necessarily draw attention to themselves. That mm -hmm. was a survival technique for many indigenous people. One of the things that happens in this narrative, and you certainly more than point to it in what you've just said, but I think it's worth underscoring. King Philip's War has been written about a lot mm -hmm. uh, from shortly after the war, beginning with Mary Rowlandson's account, actually, and going on almost immediately to ministers' accounts, mm -hmm. uh, in which there was a deep investment in presenting this as the end of Native people in New mm -hmm. England. Mm -hmm. uh, and so one of the things that happens in your book, which I think is amazing, and I have to talk about it in a certain kind of way, this is a book in which you start with Native people. Mm -hmm. You don't start with the war. Mm -hmm. You actually you end with the war, but not in a way that is terminal. Mm -hmm. um, but in which you, starting with, with Lidamu, who is a fascinating character, mm -hmm. you begin to have individual Native people in, in various settings, in various ways. They become characters, not fictional characters. They become presences. Yeah. Now, this is remarkable because lots of history doesn't do that except for great men, mm -hmm. usually great men, sometimes mm -hmm. great women. Mm -hmm. uh, so that as you move through this narrative, you are moving not only in a physical landscape, but a human landscape which is yeah. individuated at every mm -hmm. step. Yeah. Now, what makes this especially remarkable is not only your instincts as a writer to do this, but the fact is uh, it's, it is based, as you've suggested several times, but it's important to understand, it's an extraordinary archival research. Yeah. Uh, you found and used documents, as far as I know, no one had ever found before. Mm -hmm. You combined this, in part, some of your primary detectives, I think, were other Native people who got you to look for mm. or know there was something that nobody had paid attention to. Mm. So that the, the, the years of the research it's what allowed you to create, as you were, an actual Uitama, Uitama, mm -hmm. an actual James of Pinner, though we knew more about him. Mm -hmm. But they become human figures to us as we read this book. Yes. Um, and this seems to me, a, again, an extraordinary achievement mm -hmm. uh, and a very difficult one. Mm -hmm. There must have been times, I think, when you got lost. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think in some ways you benefit from getting lost, right? Um, and I think what one of the things that made my own research pro process um, distinct is that because I wasn't trying to uh, focus on the war, right? I wasn't looking for everything related to the war. I wasn't trying or aiming to reconstruct a history of the war, is that I was following uh, Huidamu, for example and her kinship networks. So that, that because that was such a difficult, intricate process, it meant that I had to go down a lot of different paths, right? Um, and so sometimes, yeah, those research paths would lead me to find a document that I was shocked that nobody else had, had foregrounded or, or even talked about, right? But at other times, it led me down paths um, that I don't want to say they went nowhere because they did go somewhere, but they were paths that I needed to go down in, in order to learn um, things that wouldn't end up in the book, right? Um, yes. or, or kind of thinking about um, an event, right? And how it may have happened. And then finding enough context through talking with other people and through going to the places and through finding more documents that it turned out, no, that's not the case at all, right? And the thing that, 
that really struck me when I was deep in this process is the way that oftentimes the documents that that um, English colonists wrote themselves yes. completely contradicted those later narratives that were designed to show the end of Indians and the justness of this war in, you know, in England. I've talked with other people who have written about this war and other wars like it, and the hardest thing is, is sometimes continuing on when you have to look at the violence of war so closely. Um, and there were many times when I nearly stopped because it was too much. It was too much. It was too much. And there were many times when I thought about completely abandoning it, not because of the difficulty and the challenge of the research, but because of the difficulty and challenge of um, confronting the violence of this war. It's certainly true, I think, if you are a historian who studies war, that you have to learn to deal with loss. Uh -huh. uh, but the context here seems to me very sharp. That is, that what, especially as a Native person doing this work, that facing the loss, which because you individu individuated so much, is not just a sort of mass sense of this happened to Indians, mm -hmm. but you also see what happened to individuals, yep. uh, which is quite devastating. Mm -hmm. And finding a way, and I, and I suspect knowing you, you, you actually intuitively at least knew that you couldn't stop. No. Because you had mm -hmm. to go on to keep, as it were, in writing, the people who were alive, alive. Yes. And that if they could survive this and go on, mm -hmm. that you had to survive it yeah. and go on. That's right. That, to say that is not to make that fact at all easy. Only when you've experienced it, you have some sense of how precarious a decision that mm -hmm. can be. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems to me that, especially because you get close to, granted they're, they're dead historical persons, but that doesn't make any difference, really, once you've brought them to life. Uh, so Wittemu seems to me the, the hardest person in your whole book. Mm -hmm. uh, that when she is killed, uh, at least I reading the book, I couldn't pick up the book again for a yeah. while. I had mm -hmm. to live with this person who comes close to you doing that. And I think this speaks back to the research process as well. Mm -hmm. um, any good historian, that is historians who work uh, with documents and archives, knows the experience, first of all, of following a path in the archives, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and you want something. You're, you're, you're following a particular path because you want a particular thing or a set mm -hmm. of things, and coming to what feels like the end of it with nothing. Mm -hmm. And this can be months and oh, even yeah. years of working with certain documents. Mm -hmm. In fact, it does educate you all the time, but you don't know that then. Mm -hmm. So there's another kind of faith about going on mm -hmm. that's required here. Um, and then the, the moments actually which enable it. I still remember one from my own work where uh, I was studying coal miners and I uh, wanted something from a woman. And I'd gone through, because they're company files, that's where mm -hmm. the history is. And usually they've destroyed them on purpose to mm -hmm. avoid being sued for what they've done. Um, and I was going through a set of company documents and I came to a cache of pay slips. And it was the end of the day nearly and I thought to myself, oh God, who wants to go through pay slips? What right. are pay slips? Going right. to? So I'm going through them and I realize that some of them have something on the back. Hmm. So I start turning them over on the back and at about the hundredth one I turn it over and on the back it says, my husband was killed in a mine accident with a date, and this is what the company gave me, and this is what the company refused me, mm -hmm. and this is where I'm left, mm -hmm. all in the small script. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of, nobody knows, and nobody ever right. turned that pay slip over, I think. Right. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And you can build from those, but mm -hmm. it takes an enormous amount of work. And, mm -hmm. and I do think that if you're the kind of historian you and I care to be, you want to make people in the past real who are commonly ignored. Yes, and I think one of the things that I hear you talking about is the way that we have the capacity as historians to restore, I don't want to say restore humanity because that sounds like what we do is too important, but to help others um, to understand the humanity. <laughs>
yes. of people who have often um, been neglected, right? Who have whose stories have been buried, like this woman's story in these mining records, right? Yeah. Uh, this is a very important story to tell about mining, right? And if you if you try to look at mining up at some big level that's just about the mining companies, then you're not going to see that woman's story. And I think that that has been one of the things that has driven me through this. And even when it's hard to look at um, some of the things that happen, including to Weedamu, it is that empathy that I feel um, yeah. towards her and towards any of the figures that I write about um, that at the end of the day I'm hoping to convey. And, and I want to be clear here because some people might not think that I'm as empathetic towards, for example, the Plymouth governor, Josiah Winslow, right? That's hard. <laughs> um, but there have been accounts that have been written um, before where people are trying to get at um, his perspective and his understanding. But oftentimes, Native people are not human um, in accounts of the war. Um, and when I say that, I don't mean to say um, historians who are writing now, I don't want people to think that I'm saying historians who are writing now are not giving enough humanity to Native people. I think there's been a lot of efforts to try to do that. Um, but if you read the accounts of the war that are written by English ministers after the war, there's this major dehumanization that goes on that none of us would be surprised to see because we know that this is part often, t uh, uh, this is often part of how colonialism works, even how war works, right? Writing about war works. But that has carried through sometimes, right? Yes. And I think um, sometimes you see uh, it's as if an, a native community like the Mohawks or the Wampanoags are all like walking in lockstep, you know, trying to understand the Mohawk motivation or the Wampanoag motivation as if there were not. Um, individual human beings who were connected to each other and talking with each other and trying to figure out how to survive this. Um, and I think that was a really, really important story to tell and an important way to frame this. And I think of that woman that you're talking about who wrote that on a scrap. I think of a woman um, who, um, whose name was Mary Nemesa, who was in prison in Boston, whose husband had been um, one of 10 men who were saved from a huge group of Native people who were sent down um, as captives by the English forces to Boston in order to be shipped to slavery. 10 men saved in order to serve as scouts on the northern front of the war. The deal was for this particular family was that um, Mary Nemesis' husband um, was supposed to be able to keep his daughter, I mean his daughter, excuse me, he was supposed to be able to keep his wife and his baby um, in a, a place that would be protected up north while he was out scouting. She was sent down to Boston. She was sold into slavery um, by uh, the commander Richard Waldron, who later denied it. But the record's there to show that he absolutely did. Um, and there were, I worked with a group of students um, at parts of this project on um, uh, not only the research for the book, but for the website that accompanies the book. And one of the students, um, a woman named Allie LaForge, um, got deeply invested in the story, right? And worked to recover as many documents as she could find that told the story of Mary Nemesit, and then wrote about it. And you can see her, her piece on Mary Nemesit on the website. But what really struck me about it is that she came to know this story so well that she was even able to, at the end of the day, collaborating with other students, figure out the last word in the document that had eluded everyone. Um, her and Cassandra Herdill, who's a, a student who's graduated from here at Amherst, they figured out that Mary Nemesa had a piece of red cloth on her arm. A piece of red cloth. And that red cloth was supposed to signify that she should not be taken down to Boston, that she should not be taken into slavery. Oh. And in fact, this piece of red cloth is part of the evidence that um, her husband and the missionary Daniel Gukin used to, to retrieve her from, from prison. And it's a very uncommon story that you see the retrieval of somebody who was supposed to be sent into slavery. But Ali, Cassandra, and the other students also had a commitment to seeing Mary Nemesa 
as a human being, yeah. right? Yes. Which is much more than, say, Richard Waldron did in, at that time. Yeah. So. I don't think this is extreme, what I'm about to say to you. I do not believe, in most instances, that there is any good history that does not pay attention to what I once called ordinary people. Mm -hmm. And I had a student who questioned me and said, why would you write about ordinary people? <laughs> uh, he said, they're dull. And I said, <coughs> mm. no, actually, they're, they're easily just as interesting as any other kind of people. Mm -hmm. And the problem with history is we generally write, sometimes it's a practical problem, because you can't write about everybody, um, is that too often uh, people who fit certain categories, in fact, are never present except as stick figures, really. Mm -hmm. uh, and the student said to me, where did you learn that? <laughs> and I laughed and I said, well, I don't think I've ever learned it well enough because it's something you have to keep learning all the time. Mm -hmm. I said, but my mother, who was 90 pounds and fi five foot tall in the 1,300 people farm town I grew up in, made me pay attention to every individual in the town. Mm. And she insisted that every individual had a story, actually, because uh, she told these stories all the time. And she, she, every once in a while, she'd stop and she'd laugh and she'd say, well, I'm not telling you about the bad ones. You're too young yet. <laughs> and that fascinated me. And then it made you want to know the uh, bad it ones, did. right? I thought, well, okay. <laughs> and when do I get to know about those? Yeah. And this reminds me of a story that Eudora Welty, the writer, tells, which I love. Yeah. And she loved going for rides in the back seat of the, her mother liked to drive around. And she drove around, always a good friend, and, and Eudora sat in the back seat. Mm -hmm. And her mother would say, now, Eudora, we have to talk with each other. And she said, then I knew I had to listen more carefully. And so she talks about how she really became a writer, oh. trying to piece together the story she wasn't supposed to hear. And she, and she says, at first, when she was really young, mm -hmm. she'd get words. Mm -hmm. They were all stories about people. Mm. in Jackson, Mississippi, of course. Mm -hmm. And eventually, she said, I could put whole sentences together. Mm. Uh, and it was that intrigue. And she never left Jackson, of mm -hmm. course. And so, and she wrote extraordinarily about them. But it's fascinating. And the other piece I have about this that influenced me is that we had a central staircase in the house I grew up in, and the bedrooms were on either side. My mother was an avid card player, and she had mm -hmm. a card club. Mm -hmm. Uh, they usually played poker, but it depended, and they drank lots. Mm -hmm. And they sat around the dining room table, which is at the bottom of the stairs, basically. And I early on figured out that I could get out of bed and crawl nearly to the top of the stairs where I could not be seen, mm -hmm. but I could never hear completely, and they would be telling each other things. Yeah. And I can, to this day, I can reconstruct some of these stories. Yeah. Uh, and it would always start with something like, did you know, or what about? I mean, there, yeah. there were cue words. Uh, and it was intriguing. And I think history would be much richer if we paid fuller attention, mm -hmm. uh, and how necessary stories are to good history. Yes, absolutely. So, but you know, we should mention the Common Pot a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I did not think you could write another book after the Common Pot <laughs> uh, because of what you do in it. Mm -hmm. uh, in some ways, it's maybe arguably even more unorthodox than this book, mm -hmm. and it was your first. Mm -hmm. It was your dissertation. Mm -hmm. Uh, so there's ways that listeners should understand that writing a PhD that's unorthodox is not orthodox. No. <laughs> uh, it's not to be done, and if you expect to have a future, you certainly don't do it. Mm -hmm. And what makes it so beautiful, first of all, the writing is extraordinarily beautiful, and, it's, and I think it's probably it was an easier narrative to construct, even though it was your first. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the book in which I realized, thanks to you, how much history needs full landscape in what it does. Mm -hmm. Because the land is really, in some ways, the major piece That's in that right. book. Mm -hmm. And it's the place where you get the common pot happens mm -hmm. on a land. Mm -hmm. So the land is what people come across and mix and, and sometimes conflict. But, so it's also a great preparation for, for this book. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's funny because I, I now think of the common pot as um, it's a book that actually you could read after Our Beloved Ken because, yes. um, you know, in both the Our, Our Beloved Ken and The Common Pot, uh, the land is central, but the land is fully animate um, as it is in, in our languages. Um, 
you, you can't talk about the land as an it. You can't talk about trees as an it. You can't talk about animals as its. And so our beloved kin extends not just to the people, but, but to all of the many beings that make up this land. And so that's something that is very present in the common pot. But the common pot is really about how Native people reconstruct their communities and their networks um, and these relationships um, in the wake of wars like King Philip's War, in the wake of colonization that is impeding not just on the land, but also on the people's ability um, to um, fulfill their responsibilities to each other and to the land. So, so I almost think of, of The Common Pot now as not just the first book, but the sequel. <laughs> um, I think that you might spend a little bit more time at the end uh, either choosing, if there is, a, spe a particularly special place for you in the book and reading it from it, mm -hmm. uh, or the other, I've always been intrigued by James the Printer. Yes. And uh, I'll lay out what my intrigue was because I, I, it, for me it was an opening into, to a kind of understanding I had not had of Native people. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm convinced that either James the Printer or one of his companion peoples, or all four or five of them, mm -hmm. were actually the translators, uh, or into native language, of the first translation of the Bible in New England. Yeah. That it was never any minister, though we always have assigned the names mm -hmm. of ministers, mm -hmm. uh, and that they did not have enough fluency in any of the native languages no. to do this. So that one of the things that gets left out, I think, in talking about him and the Indian College, mm -hmm. is what we, we need to know more, but we need to also presume a more that when we're dealing with translation here in which uh, English ministers are being given or even taking credit, mm -hmm. that in fact they couldn't have done what they take credit for. That's right. Uh, that, uh, that Native peoples were actually more dual language fluent than That's any right. of the English people. That's right. In fact, more than one. What? I love this question. I feel like I, we could talk about this for hours. Sometimes I'll have people ask me, you know, why it is that it appears that people like James Printer picked up English, for example, so much more quickly um, than um, many of the English picked up um, native languages here in the Northeast. Um, and, you know, an easy answer to that question that would take into account power dynamics would say that, well, Native people had to pick up English where English people did not um, have to pick up Native languages, right? But I also know um, that um, there were many, many different languages already here long before English or French or Dutch arrived. Um, and there were already extensive systems in place for particular people to learn each other's languages, right? So there was always yes. a recognition of people who had that um, linguistic capacity. You know, some of us, some of us are born in this world having an ear for language and some of us are not. For some of us, it's like easy to pick up languages. For some of us, it's a, it's a struggle, right? And of course, when we're children, <laughs> it's always almost easier than when we're adults. Um, but um, you had people who were Abenaki who knew how to speak Ganyangahaga or Mohawk. And Abenaki and Mohawk are entirely different, different yes. languages, yes. right? Yes. Um, but there were people who knew multiple languages already, so it would not have been a, a major feat um, to then pick up the language of the people who had come in, who you needed to trade with, who you needed to um, speak with, who you needed to figure out who they were and what they were doing here <laughs> and what that would mean for your people. Yeah. Yeah. And so when, um, when we're looking at places like the Harvard Indian College, you know, people might wonder why there's a whole chapter in this book um, on the Harvard Indian College, but it's really important to understand that as part of the foundation <laughs> of this story. Um, and there is no question in my mind that the authors of what is called the Eliot Bible, which is the first Bible to be published here, you know, in North America, um, that is 
often credited to the missionary John Eliot, that John Eliot did not have the fluency or the, the capacity to translate that. Um, and in fact, he admitted it himself. You know, one of the letters that I quote in here, you can see him saying he doesn't have that capacity. Yes. Um, and it's only when you have men like James Printer and Caleb Chishateamuk and Joel Iacombs, who were all affiliated with the Indian College, a whole group of them, um, it's only when they become part of this process that suddenly you see this Bible being translated and printed rapidly. Um, so there's no question in my mind. Um, and I think the historical research that I did will be even um, more expanded as we all learn more from um, people like Jesse Little Doe Baird and the other Wampanoag scholars who are part of the um, Wampanoag um, Language Revitalization Project um, because they are able to read that Bible, to see the multiple voices in that Bible, um, and to see the concepts in that Bible, as I learned from um, Jesse and other Wampanoag scholars, that John Eliot never would have included in the Bible. So there are ideas that sh demonstrate the continuity of indigenous um, worldviews, indigenous ideas about different spiritual figures, right? that um, would have seen blasphemous to John Eliot. And if he could read it, you know, like any teacher, if he could actually read his students' work, he never would have allowed it. But he really couldn't. Um, but all of those men could. All of those men were fluent uh, readers of their own languages. They were fluent readers of Latin, Greek, Hebrew, English, right? Um, and they helped create um, a whole body of early American literature that was multilingual, that was multi-ethnic, um, and that was really transnational. Um, and so when we talk about today wanting to think about American literature and history in those ways, that is not a new history, right. you know? Right. That is a new old history. Um, and that has been part of the fabric of this country as we think about it. Um, from its very beginnings. And when I say very beginnings, I don't just mean of the colonies. It's been part of the fabric of this land from long, from before. long before. Well, a actually, uh, I want us to, to end there uh, by reminding people watching, if, if they didn't know this, that there are a whole series of translations mm -hmm. of Bibles as you move westward. Mm -hmm. uh, and always they are presented as being done almost always by a minister uh, or by an English-speaking person. Mm -hmm. And that, in fact, we know is never the case. And mm -hmm. how do we know it's never the case? Because, in fact, when you read these Bibles, as you've said, it turns out that embedded in them, not like secret code, is a whole notion of spirituality. That is, mm -hmm. when Native people are translating from in a particular culture mm -hmm. uh, the Bible, what they're actually doing is making the Bible speak their own spiritual visions. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, the, so the, the different translations of the Bible are, are extraordinary sources if you, yes. if you read them this they way. Are. They um, are. So it's very exciting. And the other point it, mm -hmm. that is, is an old project and wish of mine, um, every immigrant group virtually to this continent has had a literature in its own language. Mm -hmm which very few scholars of American literature are trained to read right. or even know is there. Mm -hmm. Massive histories of newspapers, in some cases two centuries worth of fiction and poetry and so on. Mm -hmm. So in the truth, what this is another way in which, as with indigenous people, much of what we think we know, we don't know at all because we do not think about what it means to write a history of all the peoples of America. Mm -hmm and that they have literatures as well as histories. Yes, that's right. So I'm going to put that on you yeah. for the next book. And <laughs> that's not too small of a goal. <laughs> no. Um, but you need some colleagues for that. Many. I think the one thing I want to leave us with that's just sparked by what you said um, is that um, one of the things that I 
highlight on the website is that um, despite the fact that James Printer, right, was only a handful of men in the colonies who knew how to run the, the printing press, the first printing press in the colonies, which was housed at the Harvard Indian College, despite the fact that his hand was on so many of these um, books, um, including Mary Rowlandson. Yeah, including Mary Rowlandson's, um, his name does not appear on a title page as even a printer, never mind the printer. Um, until right before his death. And it's called the Massachusetts Psalter, right? Oh, so yes. So group of psalms. Um, and you can see it's, it's uh, you can see J Printer. It's from 1709. The beauty of that for me is what you find inside of the Psalter, um, which also to me shows James's hand and probably other native translators as well, but certainly James. And um, one of my favorites is where my God is translated to Num Manitou. And Manitou certainly uh, could be translated to God, but it, in, it really is the, uh, the spirit that flows through all things, right? So in a fully animate world, it's the spirit that flows through everything. And Manitou is a power that has both the potential for creation and destruction, right? It, there's not... Uh, God and the devil in this world, right? Um, Manitou is his power, so we have to be careful with it, right? Um, and in his translation, it's, it's num, it's my, <laughs> my, <laughs> right? And I think, wow, that is such an intriguing concept, right? My so Manitou. not only does Manitou make its way then into the Psalms, <laughs> so, you know, singing to Manitou, the spirit that's in everything, but a, a sense of uh, a personal relationship with, with Manitou, right? Because that, that my is not possessive, it's relational in the language. And so, you know, that is exactly the kind of thing that as thinkers and readers and scholars and teachers and students that we should be wrestling with.